Yeah? Yeah, I think so. Okay. And so yeah. I'm gonna do welcome and check some of your So if you want to maybe just like yeah. stand to the side. Okay. I'll stick how I'm done. Thank you. You're so sweet. I'm just old and wise. Hello everyone and so welcome. Yeah. Welcome to what matters to me and why. My name is Carrie Priest, and I'm an associate professor here in the Staley School of Leadership Studies and serving as a chair of the speaker series. Um, I'm also joined today by several members of our speaker committee and some of our sponsors. So if you um, are on the committee, would you either wave or stand and say hi so we can thank you? Yeah. Thank you. And this fall series is sponsored by the College of Education, the College of Architecture, Planning and Design, and the Staley School of Leadership Studies. So thank you um, for, for your sponsorship. Um, I believe we are now halfway, over halfway through the semester, halfway through October, and I often find myself thinking, where did the time go? And I also recognize how easy it is to get caught up in the motions of the day-to-day. -day. We engage with our colleagues and students and community members in pursuit of really important work. Um, and we hold in our relationships and in our interactions a tension between innovation and efficiency between progress and productivity with an eye on the future and a foot in reality and it is in these tensions that we are engaging with people oftentimes our engagement is dictated by our roles and our titles we know what people do but how much do we know about what matters to them and how might our work and life be different if we did know this speaker series provides a moment to pause and create a space for knowing each other, for storytelling, for listening and learning. Our speaker today will share a piece of her own story in the hopes of fostering increased understanding of our differences while shining a light on our shared values and principles of community. To introduce our speaker for today, I'm happy to introduce uh, Chuck Sexton. Chuck is a non-traditional student serving, returning to school after serving 30 years in the US, United States Army. So thank you for your service. With tours, with tours in the Middle East, Europe, Africa, Asia, and Central America. He is a history major with a minor in political science. He is married to his wife of 35 years, Melody. He has two adult children who are also K-State graduates, and he is an active member of the Manhattan community. Chuck. Thank you. Uh, that's a nice way of saying I'm old. That's not traditional. <laughs> so I appreciate that. I have the great honor today to introduce a truly amazing person, a truly amazing educator, and a truly amazing professor, who I value among one of the greatest influences on my life that I've had thus far in education, and that's Dr. Nadia Oadat. Uh, I've had the opportunity to observe professors for 40 years, and yes, I am a slow learner, uh, but in that time, I can honestly say that I have not met someone who is more dedicated to what she does than Dr. Oadat. Uh, every day when she comes to class, or when she comes to our class, she challenges her students. And she challenges those students in ways that are virtuous. She always asks us uh, if we appreciate what we have. She has the virtues that we all aspire to, which are courage, fidelity, and honor. Uh, Dr. Oadot, today in her, in her lecture, will talk to us about her personal struggle to achieve what she's done. And it is greatness. And we very seldom in our lives have the opportunity to be around someone of courage and greatness. And that courage and greatness is with the doctor. So without further ado, doctor, don't let me down. Dr. Nadia Oadat. Uh, I am humbled by this incredibly flattering introduction by one of my favorite students. And I was giving two tips that I'm going to start with. Uh, one is to speak in English. So in case I revert to Arabic, just uh, wave at me. 
And the second is, uh, thank you, Chuck, uh, to mention how beautiful the audience is. So everybody is looking awesome. Uh, thank you guys for, for coming. And uh, honestly, I, I'm used to speaking about the Middle East and I've spoken all over the world in different continents. But this is the first time I speak about my own journey. So, oh, I'm nervous. <laughs> I, I'm so glad that at least you get a free lunch out of it. So <laughs> it's not a complete waste for you. And I want to start by actually this quote by uh, Georgia O'Keeffe. Uh, she said, uh, the uh, famous American painter, she said, where I was born and how I have lived is unimportant. What I have done with where I have been, uh, that should be of interest. And I want to underline uh, what I have done. And we can't really help where we're born. We can't choose the cards we're dealt. But here, I want to argue that we have a lot to do with where we end up, regardless of where we are born. So I was born in Jordan. It's a small country. And luckily, uh, it's an island of stability in a region that hasn't had much stability for a long time. Uh, I hope a lot of you will get to see Jordan. It's not because it's my country. Honestly, it is, it's so beautiful. And I am uh, encouraged that I just met an, a young Iraqi woman who was telling me that she loves Jordan. So. Uh, I hope one day, actually, I really hope to take students to Jordan with me. So I was born in a very conservative uh, Muslim community, not unlike a lot of communities around the world that are Muslim, with certain viewpoints about women and girls. And, you know, it's, uh, it's very sad for me, but our communities are not really known for place as places where, you know, women enjoy Scandinavian-like human rights. So uh, my journey was very difficult, but not always. I've, I've been lucky, I've been, um, and I've made also some choices that ended me here. So uh, I was born and then I was followed by five boys. So I was the only girl. Uh, luckily for me, when I was very young, my father was traveling quite a bit. So the first four years, I went to a private school along with my brothers. We were like middle class family. Private education is excellent in Jordan, unlike public education. And then um, since a young age, I think I was born with a gene for reading because I absolutely, I'm a book addict to this day and not a single day goes by without me reading to this day. And, I usually read about 20 books a day, uh, different books at a time, but reading really changed my life. And uh, if you look at a lot of the biographies, I love biographies, of people who have changed our lives, they always tell you, look at the books you read and the company you keep. And I, I really cannot emphasize how much reading changed my life. So uh, as a very young girl, I quickly it was noticed that I love books. And my mom said, you know what, I'll, I'll put you in school early um, because different, well, I'm not gonna get into that story, but basically uh, in my primary school, the principal noticed that, oh, this kid really already knows how to read and write. So he bumped me up a whole grade, actually. I skipped entire first grade. So, um, I loved learning since an early age, basically. And then my father settled from his travel, and he was very unpleased. Like, why is the girl going to a, uh, um, a private school? That's a waste of a girl's education. So get her out. I don't want her to get any education. Because what is a girl good for, you know? Just uh, married, children, taking care of the household. So my mom, I was honestly, and I know this is not just a figment of my imagination, but I was the darling of the school and uh, my teachers loved me. I loved my teachers. And the reason why I know now it's not just my imagination. Uh, earlier this year, actually, my mom ran into this woman and she said to her, are you Nadia's uh, mom? And my mom was like, yeah, who are you? And she said, 
I was your uh, um, child's teacher in primary school, and I never forgot her. And I felt like so, you know, I really had that memory that my teachers loved me and saw my potential. And so, so it was really lovely to have that enforcement. But then my status changed very, very quickly. Like, uh, you know, like I dropped off of a cliff when my much more traditional father uh, settled down. My father is very religious. He built a mosque for charity, so he's very religious. You know, there's this belief that um, if you build a mosque uh, in the afterlife, um, you will have a palace in heaven. So uh, it's a very charming idea, until you go to the Middle East to do field research. And at 4 a.m. every day, uh, a few mosques go with loudspeakers at the same time, slightly different speed though. Good luck getting a good night's sleep. So. But uh, this is, you know, a, a lot of my later research would tackle a lot of these issues with the old and the new wanting space, you know, the, the modern life of meetings and, and the old of people having, you know, no way to know it's time for prayer or like this competition between the old and the new is in many ways what my life story is about. So... I went to the public school. The public school is really, I mean, it, it's not the best education. And uh, the change in my fate, I, I can tell you just one story. Uh, just the change was really severe. Uh, I used to draw a lot. And one teacher asked me to write, uh, to draw for the science class. You know, some whatever it was for the science class that day. And I was late for my next class. And the teacher said to me, why are you late? And I said, well, I was drawing for the other teacher. He said, it's not my problem. Put your hands up. And she would wipe my hands. And honest to God, my entire body was shaking for so many hours that they had to send me to the principal's uh, office. And again, I, I, I couldn't calm down because it was such a traumatic experience of being beaten. Like, it was the first time that in a school but it's the public versus private school again. So um, being a second class citizen, like you honestly never have a second to forget it. My brothers continued to go to a private school, uh, but, and my father would tell me, you want education, go work for it. So my class was very, my, my school was really far away from where I lived, so I learned to walk really, really fast. <laughs> Made me athletic, and uh, I'm yet to meet somebody, not in high heels though, please, <laughs> who can walk faster than me. But um, when I would come home, like, you know, with my, with my brothers, oh, darling, welcome, rest before you can do your homework. Or it's for me, when I come home, to the kitchen. Because when my brothers eat, they just move, and the women have to do the cleaning, and they, they don't, you know, they don't <coughs> clean after themselves or anything. So it's completely different treatments. And uh, my mom has, so my mom didn't have the heart to completely pull me out of school, luckily. So she said to my father, you know, just one more year, just put her in the public school, just one more year. And at the end of the year, I would beg and cry and, you know, and my mom would say, okay, just one more year. So this luckily worked all the way until I finished high school. But again, like doing homework was really sometimes a challenge. You have to wait until everybody is asleep and you sneak to the, you know, living room and do your homework. And it, 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 it's simply you are told your education is absolutely irrelevant. Absolutely, we couldn't care less you're lucky you're even allowed to go. So, uh, but I was allowed to go. But uh, they believed that I was maybe a second class citizen, but I didn't believe it. And if you don't believe it, it's not true. So even though I thought, they thought I was inferior, my brothers could go to a private school, my, my brothers, at one point, my, my parents didn't even want them to wait for the, for the bus of the private school. So they hired a, a, a taxi for them to take them so that they are not inconvenienced while I go walk. So, yeah. but, um, but again, I didn't believe it because honestly, like, 
lesson number one, if I am to, is you are actually the most important person to believe in you. There's nobody more important than you to believe in you. Because if you do, uh, that's it. So even though I didn't have a single person, not one, not one, tell me, you know, Nadia, you're right, you're re really trying and uh, trying to continue in school and this is good for you. Nobody told me, it, absolutely. So then I finished, I finished um, high school and my father uh, said, okay, that's it. Uh, I don't have girls who get educated. That's it. This is the maximum of my patience with this girl. And um, so, but I really wanted to be educated. So, so I'm sure all of you heard um, of arranged marriages. That's how people get married to this day, mostly in the Middle East. And people have been asking for my hand since I was 13 years old. And every time, again, like I would cry and weep and threaten to kill myself. And, but I really meant it. I was really terrified. I did not want to uh, be forced to be married. Uh, so, so back to the reading. You know, I uh, was so lucky that we have a library in our house. My grandfather was muhtar um, of my tribe, if you would. So he was a learned man, and my mom inherited some of his books. And the lowest shelf was um, literature translated into Arabic. So now I teach intellectual history of the Middle East, and I know exactly how these phenomenal works came to be translated into Arabic, because some visionary leader sent these scholars to Paris, mainly to translate uh, military manuals, but they also ended up translating Voltaire and Montesquieu and all these phenomenal ideas. So, so by the time I was 10 years old, I was reading Les Miserables, Gone with the Wind, uh, Alexander Doma, and I would read them and read them because, you know, my reality was so unacceptable to me because there's a part of me that refused, this is what my life is going to be. I'm just going to cook and clean and for the rest of my life. And I just refused, this is my life. I wanted to have agency over my life. Like even, even as a child, I honestly refused to live like my mom and my aunts and my grandmas and all the women around me. It just felt so deadly boring compared to the literature I'm reading where women have adventures and they travel and they fall in love and like all the stuff that happens only in fiction. Like in fact, when I started writing my self-fiction, I would always write it in the West because what life do women have in my environment? They just sit at home all day long. It's like, you know, a house arrest, essentially, as far as I was concerned. So, um, sorry. So at 17, my father said, that's it. Now, um, now you get married. And I said, I absolutely am not getting married. I want to go to university. And my father honestly was extreme even for his environment because from my father's side, all my cousins went to college. So I was the only one who was told, you get married or you get locked up in your room. And I said, I'll get locked up in my room. <laughs> so, so I was confided to my room for a whole year. And that was really one of the hardest years of my life. But uh, again, this is where, is what do you do with it, right? So uh, I decided, you know, I would watch, I would watch, uh, we had two channels growing up in Jordan. One is the, you know, Jordanian TV, the Arabic one, and one is the English one. And the English one, you know, had shows like uh, Friends. And, <laughs> you know, for a 17 year old, that's the life, man. <laughs> so, so I thought, maybe if I learn how to speak the language of these free people, I'll be free like them. So, and again, this is lesson number two that I really learned. And I want to say a disclaimer about these lessons I'm going to share. Even though I know and I have an experience of them being true, it's like working out in the gym. You can work out for 10 years and you'll be in top shape. But if you slack for a year, uh, just because you worked out for 10 years doesn't mean that it carries you for the rest of your life. So these lessons, you really have to live by every day. Like, 
you can't slack and you can and sometimes I do even but so the other lesson that I, I've learned over and over is that you can dream and you absolutely have 1000% control in what's in your head and oh my god please don't limit your dreams please because it's free and you're in charge and there's you set the rules right or you can look at the limitations and i decided to dream i decided to dream that you know what i want to live in the west i want to be highly educated i want to get a phd i want to travel the world while i was locked up in a room because i wanted to go to university and everybody thought shame on you why don't you follow your father and just get married my mom telling me for me for me marry this man i'm sorry mom i love you but i'm not gonna marry a stranger to please you i saw how how it fared for you so i'll pass so <laughs> so, <laughs> so so um, so in my room, I embarked on teaching myself English because I thought, you know, in this dream life that I want to live, uh, you know, I need to speak English. I need to speak like these people. So I started in our library, there was a book called Teach Yourself English uh, um, in Five Days. <laughs> I got the book. I memorized it cover to cover. Honest to God, a whole thing. And then I was really like, but you know, uh, nobody speaks English in my family. Nobody at the time. So there's nobody to practice with. And when I would listen to the TV, I, I started to make connection like, ah, when they say, I get it, it means I get it. Like, you know, there's this American accent. <laughs> so I needed to learn the accent so I can sound cool, you know? So, <laughs> so, so my mom did something amazing for me, which is she got me a small television. So I can be glued to all the English, like listening and trying to, this is how that is pronounced, you know, like get out of here, like, you know, all this, <laughs> all this stuff, right? So, uh, and then I, I, I wanted more, like, again, I still have insatiable appetite for books. I swear I'm not exaggerating. And uh, so I told my mom, please, please help me get English books. So my mom would bribe my brothers to, uh, their chauffeur would come by like downtown where there's uh, used books. So they would pick up uh, used books for me, English, but I did their homework for them. So they didn't know English. So they would bring me English, French, German, <laughs> whatever looked Western. It can't be different, right? So, but I got some English books and I started, uh, you know, again, like I, I, I still have to this day with me, actually. I, I translated, uh, a novel called Laura Dawn, and I translated a, uh, a book on the history of uh, cinema. And I started reading a lot in English. And, and again, like your, your business is to dream and let life take care of how that dream can come true. Because thank God, we're not in charge of life. We don't decide. But if you're committed enough to your dream, and you do your part 100%, I feel like life would be too embarrassed to let you down. I mean, like if, if, you, if you really do your part 100%, perfection, like you leave the gods nothing, like, you know, to uh, uh, hold against you. And, um, and I, I really, for me, that dream was, it, it grew more and more beautiful every day, as I imagined, like having agency, you know what, picking what I wear. I, to this day, I don't take that for granted. I can't. Picking this dress, I can't tell you. It feels awesome. <laughs> Every single time, I, I pick what I wear. Because at the time, like, uh, my father used to force me to wear the scarf. I didn't want to wear the scarf. I was angry with his God that told me that I was inferior. So I, I was like, you know, my God is different than your God, I think. So, but I had no choice. And... I had no choice in what I wear. And honestly, it's been, I'll, I'll tell you how I came to choose what I wear and how I came to take off the scarf. But even though I, I haven't put it on my head for over two decades, I still have nightmares about it. Because when you force somebody to do something against their will, 
that is, a, in my dictionary, a form of rape. When, and I really didn't want to put that thing on my neck. I still can't even like wear necklaces for long or it was very traumatic because for me, it was my symbol of slavery that I cannot choose. I don't have a choice. So as long as I don't have that simple choice of what I wear, I, it was a constant reminder that I am, that the legal system, the culture tells everybody that I am a property and I get, decisions are made for me. And um, so it, it, it's that, again, that, that forcefulness, that dismissiveness of what you want, your soul's desires, all your life. I mean, there are millions of, of people that are forced to do one thing or another. And I, I think as educators, we have a responsibility to bring up a generation that, that is sensitive to violence, that is sensitive and, and has the intellectual uh, strength to argue with persuasion, right? But, and this is why I studied intellectual history and history of ideas. So, so back to uh, being in that room. And you know, every time somebody asks for my hand and a lot of people ask for my hand that, that are very important in my tribe, that are, that are very wealthy. And to this day, I'm sure a lot of women think I'm crazy to have turned down some of the suitors. <laughs> But I think they're crazy to have made their decisions too. So it's mutual uh, craziness. Um, but uh, every time somebody would ask my, 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 some of my relatives would call my mom, like, just beat her up and force her. Like, why are you even letting a 17 year old decide? Um, but for me, I have made the choice and I have, I mean, this is like a blessing from the universe. I have no idea why I thought the way I did. I mean, okay, I, I had a lot of ideas and I read all these world literature and I really thought about it and engaged with it. And then I learned English and I really got into a lot of these values that, that appeal to my humanity. Like that I should have the right to have my agency and make my decisions and live how I want. And only through respect, I do things for others and, and, and not by force. And so I decided, okay, what is the worst that could happen to me if I defy my family? So the worst thing that could happen is they would kill me. Okay, let's live that reality. So I imagined that they killed me and I lamented my youth and I cried and weeped and, and I lived what it would be like. I really lived what it would be like. And then I thought, okay, now I've lived that. Now I can go for my dream or die trying. It's okay, like, I know what that would feel like, so let me go for my dream. And I really did. And this is, again, where a lot of women compromise. A lot of women succumb under pressure. And I don't blame them. Sometimes it's too much. I mean, um, so for a whole year, I stuck to my guns. I continued to read and invest in my learning for that imaginary life that I want to live. And at the end, and, and you know, mind you, it, it, was, it wasn't like I was really upbeat about it. I was, I'm pretty sure, cl clinically depressed. I mean, I remember thinking that I will never smile again in my life. I couldn't even imagine smiling. But, and this is another tip, I continued to take steps as if I'm going to arrive. Like every day I did something to get me closer to my dream as if it was a possibility. Even even though I had zero, absolutely zero chance. And I'm reminded with this with one of my colleagues about write, academic writing, telling me that write every day. I'm like, duh, I know this one. Uh, so, but you know, again, like it's working out. You have to keep at it. You can't just, uh, it doesn't carry you forward. So at the end of the year, I honestly started to give up. So I went on a hunger strike. I stopped eating and I said, I'm not eating until I go to college. Um, at that point, I think my mom realized I was serious. So uh, as luck would have it, I, I have a lot of these amazing moments of uh, good fortune. But again, I think like do your part and the gods will have mercy on you, hopefully. Um, by chance, one of our relatives came to visit us, and he was like a godfather to me when I was 
a baby because him and his wife couldn't have children. So they sort of, I was their adopted girl until they started having children. And my mom broke down in front of him and she's like, oh, the girl is stubborn, her dad is stubborn and I'm caught in between them. And he's like, let me see her. When you saw me, he was horrified. I was laying in bed, like, you know. Uh, uh, and I don't know how many days it has been, but he was very upset. And he went, I don't know what he said to my dad, threatened him enough, I guess. So my dad said, okay, she can go to a community college, which is two years, and then she gets married, but no more. You know, for me, I just wanted to get out of, the, out of, the, out of my room. So I'm like, no problem. <laughs> community college it is. So, so I went to a community college, which was across the street from uh, the University of Jordan, which is sort of our Harvard. And, and every day, I swear to you, I would stand it, it, on the hill, uh, the college, Kulit al Mujtama al Arabi. And underneath is the University of Jordan. And every day, I would tell my classmates, next year, I'll be there. And you know, my t they would tell me, my family, they would mock me like, oh, she's such a dreamer, such a dreamer. But every single dream I've had is my reality today. So dream on. Uh, <laughs> so and my classmates would tell me, darling, if you could be there, you wouldn't be here. So, but again, like I really, I would sneak in because you're not allowed to get in without an ID. I would sneak in and I would walk in the streets of the university. I'm thinking, I'm going to be here next year. I, I got to be here next year. I, I belong here. I, you know, so and I did this so often. It was like an obsession. It's like my obsession with being highly educated. And like I lived it. I felt it. I, and then as luck would have it, even though it came through a little bit of a sad uh, story, my, my favorite brother, the youngest, uh, was diagnosed with leukemia. And I was in the hospital uh, uh, with him, babysitting him while my mom went to the house, whatever. And that moment, uh, the man who came to visit him was King Hussein's driver. And King Hussein, you know, he's, he's a, a loved, beloved world leader. And he truly was a phenomenal, magnificent, uh, leader, in my opinion, for Jordan, you are not likely to meet a Jordanian family that doesn't have a story about King Hussein like the one I do. Like it's, he's known for being very magnanimous, very, when Assad and Mubarak tortured their adversaries, uh, King Hussein gave them uh, a ministerial position. I mean, like, not torture, it's like, hey, you think you can do better? Here, take a position. It, it's, it's so, he's, he's a, a very special man. So special that he listens to his driver. I mean, so, <laughs> so luckily for me. So uh, he was our neighbor, the, the king's driver. And uh, I don't know what made me speak, but I spoke and I said to him, he's, so I'm from a tribe, the biggest tribe in Jordan, uh, Bani Hassan. And he is from Bani Sakhar, another very important tribe. And we have this tribal code that if I, if I come to you and I sort of humble myself to you and tell you I'm your refuge, if you have honor, you would grant me uh, my wish before you even hear it, right? So I, I said to him, uncle, I'm your refuge. He's like, what do you want? I said to him, I want to go to the University of Jordan. He's like, okay. He spoke to the king that day. I get a call, apply to the university. <laughs> Honest to God. So, so and again, like uh, the timing was absolutely mind blowing because it was the time for applications. And I got into the University of Jordan. So uh, that was an amazing luck. And, um, you know, I, I think, again, this is uh, my Wyoming mom loves to uh, say this proverb, and I really believe in it. Uh, luck is where opportunity meets readiness. Again, like you get ready, let the universe work its thing. You, you just do your part. You have no, I have no control over my father, over my parents, over the culture. But I have control over what I do with my time. So, so anyway, so I got to the University of Jordan because my father couldn't say no to the king's man. I mean, you know, I'm just a girl after all. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm not worth that much. But so I get to the University of Jordan and my father, you know, he's not thrilled about it. And even though he was more than happy to put all his uh, 
kids in private schools, for me, every penny was like coming out of his teeth or something. So, and uh, one term, like second term or something, he said, I have no money. I mean, for me. So I said, okay, you know what? I need to be independent. I need to find, uh, I need to find a job where nobody knows I'm working because I'm not supposed to work, where my family doesn't know, where I can be a full-time student and uh, work. And I kept thinking like, okay, how do I get a job like that? This is, a, this is what I want in the world. And at that moment, um, you know, I had taught myself English and I knew a lot about Western culture. And at that moment, uh, it was a break for, there's a, a big program at the University of Jordan of English as uh, Arabic as a, a second language. And at that moment, there was a coffee break and there pours in all these foreigners. And I thought, aha, <laughs> I need to work with them. In their culture, it's okay for me to work. And they wouldn't go tell my dad, shame on you, your daughter is working. So I need to find a way to work with them. And I was like, well, if they are there to learn Arabic, I'll be an Arabic tutor. So then I posted an ad for Arabic lessons. And before you know it, this is, again, like one of these amazing moments. My very first student, uh, her name is Jane Kemp. I think she took that uh, picture you, you are seeing in me in Oxford. She came to my graduation. She was my absolute first student. And she would attend my graduation at the University of Jordan and later Oxford uh, and would visit me in Wyoming. She brought me five other students. Everybody, like I had more students than I could handle. And I kept upping my uh, fees. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever tells you money is power, oh, it is. <laughs> so, so, and one of them, one of my absolute fav first students would later write to my Oxford, later my Oxford, um, Oxford uh, supervisor, Eugene Rogan, to tell him, look, you gotta supervise this girl or I'll never talk to you again. Like, it's very sweet, because it was decades later, right? But uh, they were, I taught PhDs from Oxford, right? This is the first time I hear about like, Oxford, wow. <laughs> so, uh, so I started tutoring and I started making a lot of money. And all of a sudden, I'm making like seven times the average Jordanian. So then, uh, I, I told my mom, Mom, uh, I am teaching. At, at first, you know, I had to break it slowly. I'm teaching this, this woman. She's a convert to Islam. And, but, you know, again, my mother has never made a penny outside the house in her life. So she got empowered through me. All of a sudden, she doesn't need to, like, go ask my dad. So she has another source of income. And it liberated her a lot. And... Your brain works better when you, you know, when you're independent financially. And uh, so then I also started telling my dad, hey, look, every day to go to university, I would commute four hours every day, three buses each way. And I basically told my family, look, four hours, that's a lot of money. I, if I move near the university, that's four hours for you. Like, you know, and, uh, so I, I moved away from home. I took off the scarf. I, I really feel like I bought my freedom, honestly. So um, you start to have a lot of voting power, you know, when you are valuable. So, so basically, to uh, wrap it up real quick. So um, I finished the university, and I applied to, uh, again, the dream stayed with me of really getting a PhD because I I've always loved ideas and the debate in ideas and um, growing up in an environment where there is not that free flow of ideas and exchange of ideas makes me appreciate them that much more. So luckily for me, I got a scholarship at the University of Wyoming. And uh, I went to Wyoming. In Wyoming, I had an amazing mentor, uh, actually more than one. I really. I was so lucky with my mentors and, you know, I think it's because I was telling a colleague of mine, my philosophy is like every, every single act of, of kindness that somebody bestows upon you, even a smile, is a choice. Because I know other people make different choices. 
So I really appreciated when my mentors did some things for me or helped me or, so I really revere them. And in fact, the first two books of my, that I'm writing are dedicated to my mentors because I want to thank them in, in the style I really wish to convey how much I'm grateful for them. So, and one of my greatest mentors is when I moved to Washington, D.C., uh, the president of the Rand Corporation at the time, Bruce Huffman, he's a professor at uh, uh, Georgetown University, wrote me a stellar letter of recommendation that got me to Oxford and Cambridge. But Oxford gave me more money, so I went to Oxford. <laughs> and, uh, and again, I wanted to study. So, so much of my life is governed by these old ideas about you know, this is the way it is, this is the sacred, this is the divine, you do this, you do that. And, and again, I really wanted to find out for myself, like how much of this is really Islam, how much of it is people, how much of it is a human, how much is it? I wanted to know for myself. I wanted, so uh, I embarked on uh, studying Islamic history and uh, intellectual history. And uh, when I finished, I really, again, wanted to, I, I want to write, I want to contribute thought to my region because there's not a lot of women contributing to thought. And our region has been, the debate has been stifled because we've had one authoritarian regime after another, like in the region as a whole. So there's not that debate of ideas. And the vast majority, honestly, of Middle East scholars cannot read the, the medieval text. So, but I can. And it's, I feel like, People like me have an added responsibility because we can tell our own history. We can revise the history of authoritarianism. We can, so, so I pursued a PhD in Middle East history and intellectual history, and I only applied to universities like Kansas State University that are research focused, that have a reasonable load of 2-2, which is why how I ended up here at K-State. And I absolutely love my job. I love my students. I feel they are so appreciative and so kind. Like Chuck here is such a, an example of that. It, it's very humbling. It, it's, uh, and I get to read, write, research, and debate ideas for a living. So that's, in a nutshell, my story. And I, I'll leave time for a question and answer. <laughs> We do have some time for Q&A. We're going to ask because we have folks on Zoom that you would use the mic. But if you have a question, could you just raise your hand? Thank you, Nadia, so much for this amazing, oh, um, you know, presentation about your life and how you went through, you know, almost like if anyone would be in that position, they would be very hopeless. You know, they're like, it's the end of the world. I don't have any chance. And getting where you are now um, you. and honestly I'm just very happy that you came to K-State you Thank know you. and I got to meet you and hopefully uh, we'll meet you more but throughout your story I of course you know since we're from the same region yes. and I'm very familiar with your culture and probably are very familiar with mine um, throughout your story when you said that you moved out of your parents' house when you were in Jordan. Yeah. It's very they, unusual. Exactly. It and is so they, unusual. Yeah. Didn't they like guilt trip you like throughout? Because that's truly, that's what a lot of people in such culture oh. use. That's the biggest weapon, which is guilt because it's not... You know, I have a few PhDs in that. Like, yeah. <laughs> I understand, you know, like a lot of people, not everyone, I'm not going to say everyone. There's yeah, yeah, no yeah. Such no, thing, this is very, very a lot unusual. Of people, you know, in that region or in that culture, they raise their children based on guilt. Like, Absolutely. if you do this, you're going to go to hell, you know, yeah. or if you do this, your dad or mom will be mad instead of like saying, you know, so being supportive. Yeah. So there's no individualism, please, basically. Yeah, yeah, tell yeah. me, so, how do you deal with that? Uh, yeah, it, it really is, I have never met anybody uh, during that time. In fact, I was telling my students when they would tell me, you know, you should, you should move away. I'm like, that doesn't happen in our culture. It's very unusual. But again, you plant the seed and you start to get incredibly, so if there is a will, there is a way. That was my motto. I wrote it everywhere. There is a will, there is a way. So how it happened is, first I said, let me move to a dorm. 
because every day four hours is a lot. And again, the power of cash, like it's so amazing. Uh, and then the dorm situation didn't work out. So then I uh, found an apartment, uh, a two bedroom apartment with a big living room. And I rented each, it was for $200. And I rented each room for $100. And then I slept in the, in the living room. So <laughs> <laughs> necessity is the mother of invention, you know? But again, I, I really think that my parents were, I think maybe the shock of it or, or, and I was so dutiful. Like I would go every weekend. I gave them every single last penny I earned. My grades suffered like crazy because I, I would even sometimes not buy my school books to give them every penny. I swear to God, I had one pair of pants that I washed. Like I didn't indulge myself in any shape or form. So it's really, I think it just, uh, and it, it took a while, like sometimes, first I said, you know what, why don't we put one of your brothers with you? But the, the roommates didn't like that situation. So it took years, but eventually they accepted it. And it was in a building that was very secure and uh, there was somebody all the time and like maximum security, but it took a long time. But yes, it's very unusual. Even boys don't do it, but also it's very expensive. Yeah, very unusual. It would have been impossible for my sister to pull that off, actually. But somehow, maybe because, but they didn't tell anybody, by the way. Nobody knew. In, in fact, oh, no way. The people would pressure them. So as, as far as anybody was concerned, I was in a dorm. And because we lived two hours away, it was, you know. Uh, and when I tutored, I didn't even tutor with my real name. I put one of my uh, students, I picked the name Maxine for me because like, oh, it's from Maximus, you're great. That's, and they called me Max. So I was always with these foreigners and I'm speaking English to them. I had, I had no time to have friends. I was working full time and studying full time. So I'm always with these foreigners and everybody thought I must be a foreigner like them. Honest to God, nobody would even suspect. So later I would teach English at the University of Jordan and one of my students was from my tribe. And he said to me, you know, you have no idea what the women in my tribe are like. They're nothing like you. <laughs> <laughs> and, because honest to God, he, and I understand, I, I'm from that tribe. They, they, would, they would think there is no way you are from this tribe. Like, because you, they don't look like this. They don't do this. They don't, so you don't fit the mold. So, so people just don't suspect even, you know? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It was a fascinating talk. Uh, I'd like to um, hear something about what you think can be done for other women uh, back home, because I'm sure you are not the only one who wishes to change mm. things and have an education and no. uh, search for a different type of life. So what can we do? Or can be done, if anything. You know, uh, you're absolutely right. I am part of a huge generational, you know, struggle, if you would. I mean, and the Arab Spring is so, some part of it, right? Like the peaceful, hey, I have a, a legitimate uh, reason to, and the way it was met with absolute violence, it, it's exactly a kind of dynamic, the old and the new, right? So what can we, do, what can be done? You know, our, our regional problems have become world problems. So it's no longer just, oh, you know, it's a Middle East issue. It's a world issue. And even in the West, there's an opportunity because there's a lot of Muslims in the West. There's a lot of Muslim families. So I have a friend in Washington, uh, and she grew up in the Netherlands. She doesn't even know Arabic. Uh, she is not Muslim even, but she can't tell her family that. And none of her sibling, uh, the, uh, sisters or her are educated because like my father, her father believed that, you know, women don't get educated. So as, as, as the, the second they hit high school, he pulls them out of school. So the Dutch government had a choice and she would tell, she would tell the teacher, look, my father is threatening me to kill me if I, if I take off the scarf. 
but I don't want to wear it. She would tell this. And the teachers were like, whoa, this is a Muslim family business. Uh, we don't want to interfere. So, so she didn't get an education. She wishes she did. And none of her sisters did. Why did the Dutch government allow her father to get away with not educating so many girls? They are in the West. But again, it's that question like, so the West often, sadly, even in foreign policy, the West appeases my father and her father because they don't want to offend who's in control. They, they don't make a bet on the young people often, right? To this, I mean, this can change. And a lot of us are taking responsibility and I'm mentoring so many girls from the Middle East. Like I was just talking to one of them yesterday who told me, you know, you changed my life. For 10 years, I lived off of your emails and now she's in America. But so we're doing our own work, but the West can do a lot. Scholarships for women is definitely, I believe in education, clearly. So there's, if there's a will, there's a way, right? And, but even working with Muslim communities in the West, there are now millions of them. And these, these questions are not easy. And they are really, really like, has to be tackled in a very nuanced way, right? Because, so I want my mother who wears a scarf to be walking down the streets of America without fearing for her life. Or that somebody who's ignorant of what she's like, who would attack her. But I also want to be free to not, to choose what I wear. I want choice for both me and her. So how do you, how do you, how do we as, we, there are a lot of educators in this room, how do we as educators bring up citizens who can make that nuanced decision to create a space for my mother's generation, but also for us, who want completely to be part of the 21st century and part of our world and live like everybody else that we see on TV, you know? <laughs> Please. Yeah. Um, the question is, how do you conceptualize what your contributions will be in terms of research and publishing, and what will your legacy be? Wow, that is such a cool question. Because now I'm dreaming of that, exactly. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm, I'm following my own advice of dreaming big, but I'll tell you. So I really wish to contribute to Islamic thought first. So my, I mean, it'll take me years, but this is the, uh, the dream is, because we need critique, but critique needs freedom, freedom of thought, freedom of expression, freedom of debate. And the reason why I am in the academy and here at K-State and not in a forum in DC or Washington, which I keep getting offers to be with a double the salary, is because I believe in ideas. And the academic space is one of the few spaces where I can do that. So for me, this is, I'm already where I wanna be. I'm already on the path. So we need critique. And we need this critique to be safe. Uh, we need scholars to be able to debate ideas without fearing for their lives. And when you talk about Islam, the Middle East, you know, I'm sure you're, a lot of you are following what's happening in the news now with Saudi Arabia, uh, with Jamal Shakokji, who is a very, very slight, you know, dissent light. What happened to him? So, but I, I really do dream of contributing to this debate because I, I can engage with the original text. And I also, my second book, which I, I now I'm putting on hold, is on the intersection between technology and ideas. As an intellectual historian, I'm fully aware how technology is revolutionizing the playing field. So for me, I got access to uh, um, censored books through my Western students. They used to literally copy the books for me. This was before the internet. And I would read them. And at a time when I thought there's nobody like me, I read Noel Sadawi. She's a feminist, Egyptian feminist. And I thought, aha, they do exist. They just, I just didn't know they exist because they were censored. Uh, the Arab world have severe censorship standards. But the internet is leveling the field where all these phenomenal authors or uh, now their books are available online, pirated, and authors are thankful for that. So my second book tells the story of people that are trying to break the, the, the old 
ways of my way or I kill you and trying to create a space of non-violence and more debate. So my second book, I believe, will really inspire a lot in the West and gives them uh, academics and the general audience alike uh, a blueprint, if you would, because when you hear about people like, uh, I'll tell you one story. Uh, Amr is a young man from Jordan, Palestinian Jordanian, who uh, one time he was watching his kids watch TV and um, he was very disturbed by what his kids were learning from TV, that we are superior because we are Muslim, unlike the infidels. And he thought, you know what? I don't want my kids to learn, to grow up believing it's them against the world or other superior. I want them to, em to embrace the world. And again, maybe, um, so he quit his job and he started this uh, children's stories online that are focused beautifully done, brilliant. Even I love reading them and I'm an adult and they're really like, wow, inspiring. Because he wanted to instill in his kids values like uh, critical thinking, being curious about the other, uh, not tolerance in the sense of uh, I can tolerate you because I can't now subdue you, but, but really like, hey, I can be different because you can be different. So he really wanted, so his, his uh, platform uh, even though it's only been three years, it now gets millions of downloads every single month. That is so promising. But people like him who think consciously, like I do, like we think consciously, how do we make a difference? Because it's no longer just our problem. It's a world problem. And I really believe as an academic, I want to contribute academically, but I also feel a responsibility to distill a lot of the academic work into language that the wider public can be engaged in. Because, you know, this, this again, uh, impacts all of our world. So we can't just be in our small esoteric circle. It's important that we do the small circle, but we also uh, do a version for the public because they vote, thank God. <laughs> So, you know, we have the choice of who our leadership is. And if we have a better understanding of, for example, we shouldn't be selling censorship, uh, internet censorship programming to uh, dictators because we are, uh, we are signing away more refugees and more violence when we do that. They put two and two together, what it means, you know? We shouldn't be stopping uh, scholarships to America because I have met, honestly, almost all of the brilliant people I met in the Middle East for my second book, which is called A Million Clicks to Freedom, but I may change it, don't hold me to that. <laughs> uh, if anybody has a sexier title, let me know. Um, um, a lot of them, 99%, studied in the West. They came here and they loved like, oh, what? we can disagree and nobody's threatening anybody. And they wanted these beautiful values, which they believed are universal. They wanted them back home. So they went back home. And again, I can tell you a story after story. I'm writing a book about these people. So, so you know, uh, it's important to educate the wider audience as much as engage the scholarly debate and critique. I'll tell you one more question. Um, so, with your experience, um, I was wondering how that, um, like leaving home and coming mm. for your education and furthering your career, mm. how has that affected your relationship with your your dad or like your family uh, members? And yeah, I think, how do you think you have influenced people in your region with the steps yeah. that you took? Uh, so, I am told by a lot of my, uh, especially cousins, that I have caused a mini revolution. <laughs> because, you know, we are told, again, guilt tripped, obey, 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 and oh, you get everything you want once you die. And I did disobey, 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 and oh, wow, she's on CNN. She got a PhD from Oxford. She's in America. She's traveling the world. What the heck? Right? <laughs> so, so, Again, like actions speak louder than words, man. So 
You know, I remember, I think I fell in love with America, honest to God, when I was watching once the news and I saw Madden Albright. So I was in my living room and we are bombarded anti-Americanism, especially on pan-Arab TV, uh, run by our uh, allies. And um, I remember uh, they, they announced that she became Secretary of State. And I thought, an immigrant, a woman, became Secretary of State of the most powerful country on Earth? Wow, that can be a bad country. <laughs> There's no way an immigrant can rise to, the, to be the Secretary of State of the strongest country. So all the brainwashing wiped out in a split second. And a lot of girls, so when, when I had these dreams, like my mom, I remember her once telling me, what have I done to let you watch TV? You think we can live like these people on TV? We are women from tribes. Like, but, but girls can look at me. I have, you know, they can go to my YouTube channel. They know what it looks like to get an education. You know, I, I get an internship once with one of the royal princes. And like, if I, if I decide to go to Jordan, I can get a really, even when I was a PhD student, my tribe asked me to represent them in parliament. So it's, but I, I uh, you know, it's not my interest. So, but the thing is, uh, no matter what they're told, you can tell, like, uh, I really believe in the power of truth, right? Somebody could tell it's really much better if you just obey. Or you see somebody, I make all my decisions. There's no force on earth that, you know, what would you like to have some uh, insensitive bully make all the decisions for you or you live your life and you travel and you, you meet some of the most brilliant thinkers of your time at Oxford and all around the world and have amazing colleagues and contribute and self-actualize and have a chance to actually, whether I do it or not, it doesn't matter. The journey is beautiful. Have a chance to actually create your own thought. I mean... It's, it's very powerful. I mean, uh, some members, especially Mia, are very angry, but I think the girls, they're either jealous or, or they really want to follow my footsteps or both. And I applaud it. Absolutely. So. Let's get Naya. I truly wish we had more time, um, and I, I think Nadia is willing to stay for just a few minutes and, and perhaps share if you have a question, but thank you again for attending, and I hope you can um, come to our November session as well. Uh, thank you again. Thank you.